courtyard of the Manoir de la Marquette. This ancient place has silently witnessed many of the historic and dramatic events that have molded the destiny of Jersey and its peoples. Let us now share the secrets of the spirits and people who have shaped Jersey's heritage. It is they who have met the challenges of our past and who have laid the foundations of our future. But first, we must go back to the very dawn of Jersey's creation. The granite rocks that make up the Channel Islands are unimaginably old. They were thrown up a thousand million years ago from the very depths of the earth. Historic hunters lived in those caves 250,000 years ago. They used to kill woolly mammoths and rhinos for food by driving them off that cliff. In those days, Jersey was part of the same land mass as England and France until the sea level rose and Jersey became an island. So we now know what Victor Hugo meant when he said, The Channel Islands are pieces of France dropped in the sea and picked up by England. Early settlers left us fine examples of their craftsmanship and mysterious monuments. The Romans called Jersey Caesarea. But then for nearly 500 years, Jersey disappears from the history books, as Europe entered a dark age of pagan and barbarian rule. But wait, my friend. You speak of pagans and barbarians. Haven't you forgotten the Christian missionaries who came to Jersey? Oh, oh holy man. I am Helia. I came to this remote place nearly 1,500 years ago in search of peace and sanctuary. I lived alone on this sea-beaten rock, which now overlooks the town that bears my name. But my friend, you arrived here several hundred years later. My ancestors were Vikings. They raid and plunder your monsters. And murder and take away our people as slaves. Yes, in the beginning. Many of our people stayed and made this island their home. They owed their allegiance to the Duke of Normandy. How, sir? They paid Norman taxes. They spoke the language. They obeyed Norman laws. All of which is allowed to the present day. In time, my family were granted land in Jersey. Built this fine dwelling. We became seigneurs, lords of the manor. In return for the land, we were obliged to pay military service to Andrew. Did you sail with William the Conqueror's Norman army to invade England in 1066? Yes, we beat the English at the Battle of Hastings. And William was crowned King of England at Westminster on Christmas Day. And now the English had to pay Norman taxes, obey Norman laws. Dot Norman culture and <laughs> learn to speak French. <laughs> <laughs> In 1204, King John was forced to give Normandy back to the French. The landowners in Jersey decided that their loyalties lay with the English, not the French king. So from then on, the French coast, just over there on the horizon, became enemy territory. Castles were built at Montagoy and here at Gronay to defend Jersey from repeated French attacks. Until in 1483, the Pope declared the Channel Islands neutral to spare them further misery. Neutrality gave Jersey women an unexpected bonus. They could now trade with both England and France, even when the two countries were at war. And many resourceful islanders took full advantage of this freedom to become merchants and traders. But they had to be careful. Jersey's surrounded by treacherous reefs and rocks. Over there are the Minkies, to the north are the Paternosters and the Ecrio, where many ships have been wrecked and their crews and cargoes lost. Here at Corbiere, disaster can strike at any time. <laughs> 
1565, a group of islanders sailed to settle on Sunday. One of their ships carrying the children struck the paternosters. They were all drowned. Some say you can still hear their cries above the waves. This was a time when magic and mystery were fueled by the dark mists of the wild, wind-blown spray. Fairy stones mark the sacred sites of prehistory. Granite stones jutting from farmhouse chimneys were used as witches' resting places as they broomsticked through the night. Be not afeared. The isle is full of noises, sounds, and sweet airs that give delight and hurt not. The dawn of the Elizabethan age created many challenges and brought prosperity to many Jerseymen. The governor, Sir Walter Raleigh, named Elizabeth Castle Fort Isabella Bellissima as a tribute to his queen. Merchant adventurers and explorers sailed out in search of fame and fortune. Some went in search of cod off the Grand Banks of Newfoundland. A lucrative trade developed, carrying stores to Newfoundland dried fish to the Americas, sugar and spices to the Mediterranean, and wine and fine goods back to England and the Channel Islands. This became known as the Cod Triangle. Shipbuilding and knitting became important industries. Sailors and fishermen needed warm clothing to keep the cold and wet out when they were at sea, and so the women folk knitted their men thick sweaters, or jerseys as they became known using wool from the local four-horned sheep. Elizabeth I wore jersey stockings, and Mary Queen of Scots went to the scaffold wearing a light blue pair decorated with silver. For the ordinary folk, life went on as it had for centuries, like here at Hanton. Crops had to be harvested, livestock tended, fishing nets needed to be mended, cattle landed, boats repaired. For centuries, seaweed or rack had been collected from the beaches to be used as fertiliser, just as it is today. Here in Booley Bay, another isolated coast, Jerseymen reaped another more profitable harvest from the sea through smuggling and even piracy. Privateers operated with letters of mark and committed acts of legalised piracy. They could attack French and other foreign ships in the name of the king. One Jerseyman Sir George Carteret played his part in these events. King Charles I appointed me as his agent. I was to sell all the captured ships in order to buy munitions of his army by John Cromwell. I was able to assemble an invasion force to recapture Jersey from the ground. I seized all their assets and built a small fleet to attack and capture more ships. And did you send all the profits back to the king? Well, no. I had to keep some. After all, I had many uh, overheads to attend to. For example, I had to look after the young Prince of Wales when he escaped to Jersey with his huge entourage. I entertained them at Elizabeth Castle for ten weeks at my expense. And then, when we heard the sad news that the king had been beheaded, we here in Jersey were the first to claim the young prince, King Charles II. And the young king rewarded the people's loyalty by presenting them with a silver gilt mace, and I believe granted you land in Virginia. Yes, it did. Which I renamed New Jersey in his honor. But Sir George Carteret didn't have it all his own way. Cromwell's forces recaptured Jersey in 1651. Sir George and the remnants of the Royalist forces took refuge in Elizabeth Castle over there, 
all their provisions and their gunpowder they kept stored in the Abbey Church on the left of the little island. But unfortunately for them, a mortar fired from the town landed on the old church. <laughs> Further resistance was impossible. Throughout the 17th and 18th centuries, Channel Island's privateers kept attacking French shipping. The British islands are the refuge of defrocked monks and all sorts of vagabonds. Jersey Paris descended on the village near Caen and stole oxen, cows and sheep. The French could take no more. In 1779, France and Spain plotted an invasion of Jersey. Twenty-two Martello towers were built to strengthen the island's defences. Soldiers of fortune also prepared to invade. One, Baron de Vulico, set sail from Granville and navigated his tiny invasion force through the treacherous tides and reefs. Midnight. January the 6th, 1781. With the senior officers away on Christmas leave and the local guards at La Roque busy celebrating Twelfth Night, I landed my forces in Jersey. No one expected us to attempt an invasion in the depths of winter. The element of surprise was ours. <laughs> I had led 600 men into St. Helier. We surprised the governor in bed, and I pretended we had landed with 4,000 troops with 10,000 more on the way. When he heard this, he soon surrendered. But I had not anticipated the spirit of the Jersey people, and in particular, one young Major Francis Pearson. I was currently serving far from my native Yorkshire, but Jersey was my newfound home. A beautiful, rugged island I had grown to care for. So, it's the French. They've taken the governor. But what of Mulcaster is in this little castle? And they have to acknowledge the surrender. She still stands, but under the fire. Governor, be quick now! We mustered our forces. Our numbers were strong, but we had been caught off guard by the French, and they now had a key strategic position. Through the early days, we may never want to see the man of India. Jersey would not as French forces. We take it one bit forward. The people here, they belong to me. If we send them down to that thing, then all of these chains will cut off the arms of the states. We saw the attackers before. We soon discovered the location of the French forces. Many skirmishes ensued. We positioned ourselves around the world squares and rivers. For Jersey, man! here in Royal Square. The Battle of Jersey was the last land battle to be fought in Britain, but it wasn't until the defeat of Napoleon in 1851 that the long struggle with France was over. And it was here that Queen Victoria and Prince Albert were welcomed on their state visit in 1846, the first by a monarch in over 600 years. It only lasted three hours, but the people
people made the most of every glorious second. There were bonfires and fireworks. And the Queen herself described St. Olin's I never saw a more beautiful deep blue sea. During Queen Victoria's reign, overseas travel became fashionable as steamships operated regular ferry services to popular destinations, including Jersey. The first trains chugged along the coast laden with happy visitors. And what about the divine Lily Langtry? Lily was the toast of London society in the late 1870s. She was adored by aristocrats, poets, painters, royalty, all were captivated by her dazzling beauty. Lily is buried here in the churchyard of St. Saviour's, close to where she was born, brought up, got married, and where her father preached. Lily was completely ungovernable when she was a child. She and her brothers were well known for their practical jokes, their wild behaviour, and their irreverence. Lily was fiercely independent, headstrong, and completely ungovernable. I was born Emily Charlotte Le Breton. The local people used to think I was a bit of a tomboy because I used to play cricket, go rock climbing, even ride a horse bareback dressed as a boy. One day my younger brother and I bought an old mare that we secretly trained at home. We entered her for the races on Gory Common and we won! But the first papa knew about it was when he read it in the papers the next day. <laughs> But when you were 14, did you have to start behaving like a proper young lady when you entered Jersey society? Why should I? Do you know I got my first proposal of marriage from the Archbishop of Canterbury's son a year later? And you married Edward Langtree when you were... 22, and he took me to London. Then Edward, Prince of Wales, after to meet you? Dearest Bertie, we became lovers. But that nearly all ended when I put a spoonful of ice cream down his neck. <laughs> he was not amused. Lily went on to become a successful actress. She was also a notable racehorse owner. Her horse Merman won both the Sandwich and the Aston Gold Cup. She had to call herself Mr. Jersey on the race card. Lily retired to Monaco, where she died in 1929. And her heart remained in Jersey. Lily Langtry seem to epitomise the bold and carefree spirit that was so fashionable at that time. Overseas travel and tourism boomed. Aeroplanes landed on the beach in St. Oban's Bay. However, the euphoria was not to last, as once again, war threatened. to show he could occupy British territory. lowered the Union Jack in surrender. Jersey had been abandoned. Anyone not born in Jersey was liable for deportation in German camps in Germany. Jersey was completely cut off. The last nine months were the worst. We spoke the local patois so they couldn't understand us. Food and medicine almost ran out. We nearly starved. I wanted my own small fishes for harmless things. The Germans suffered too with meager rations. Towards the end, there were few dogs or cats left on the island. We'll never forget the 
the arrival of the Vega with the first Red Cross food parcels. Soon the nightmare was over. People flocked into Royal Square to hear Winston Churchill declare, and uh, our dear Channel Island are also to be free today. After the liberation, people soon picked up the pieces of everyday life. St. Helia became the bustling capital and a financial centre of world importance. Tourism once again flourished. Yet, we have still managed to retain a quiet and idyllic way of life which is the envy of many. Beneath our apparent Englishness lies a thousand years of Norman But a new future beckons with many changes in a wider community of nations in which we must play our part. We're proud that Jersey is the first tourism location in the world to enjoy green globe states. We're pledged to maintain and protect and conserve this island's natural charm. We must preserve Jersey's unique and exquisite beauty. It is a garden of flowers, cradled by the sea. But we must return our backs on the past because it is now history. We must learn the lessons of our past and act before it is too late. to protect our planet and preserve our way of life, our separate identity, and pass it on to our children, grandchildren, and succeeding generations. Jersey's climate, its change of pace, granite houses, woods, meadows, and wonderfully varied natural habitats are all there for us to continue to enjoy and cherish. Over the centuries, I've witnessed Jersey's people face many crises in their long and distinguished history. I have shared with pride their resolute, independent, and adventurous spirit as they have adapted to meet every new challenge. And as I continue to watch over this beautiful island, I know in my heart that Jersey's destiny is secure. The tide is coming. It is now time to leave. Go in peace and share with us our wonderful